the way this is working, but what happened was Hamilton County went purple, and when Hamilton County went purple, Hamilton County Planning Department said no one could have in-person meetings. Mm. So um, Steve has agreed to try to zoom in and do, um, talk. He, Steve is our county planner, for those of you guys who don't know, and he's been working with us, if you remember, it was back last June, I believe May or June when we received the grant, maybe a little later than that, from Hamilton County, the planning grant, and we've been working, I'm gonna take this off, We've been working, you know, obviously since then um, on this process. Uh, Steve and uh, the county workers, county planners have been amazing. They've been great to work with. Uh, in the, I sent all of you guys a copy of the plan today. I apologize it was so late. Um, they were trying to finalize everything and get it in its hopefully final form. But we're meeting with you guys tonight. We're meeting with the Planning Commission the first week in February, and then hopefully, if there's not any big issues, we'll, this will be the final plan, and we'll present that to Council on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, and hope, our hope is that the Council would adopt the plan, and this would give us a vision or direction uh, for what we want to see happen on Montgomery Road in the future. Um, it's a conceptual plan or a vision. It's not a detailed architectural drawing or an engineering study. So, but it does give an idea of what we would like to see. So, um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know, um, I'm the only one here tonight, but we have a very powerful steering committee. Some of you may or may not know who's on it. Uh, from the city, Tom Perry and Catherine Fitzgerald are on the steering committee. Um, from our city itself, <clears throat> Sarah Allen, who's the program director for the Center for Great Neighborhoods in Covington, is on the steering committee. She lives here in Norwood on Mills Avenue. Hillary Cannon, who works for the Mercantile Library, who lives on Hazel, is also on the steering committee. Ben Eilerman, who's the development project manager for Over the Rhine Housing, who lives on Carter. Uh, is on the steering committee and David Thompson, vice president for affordable housing for the model group is on the steering committee. So they're all Norwood residents. We also have Liz Bloom, Sean Comer and um, Emma Shirey from Xavier. Liz Bloom is the executive director of the Community Building Institute. Sean Comer is the director of government relations and Emma is a community building associate. Tim Kling, the director of um, real estate from UDF, is on the steering committee, and also Ty Belize, the owner of AJ Cheesecakes. So we wanted Ty to be on the committee to represent a small business owner in Norwood, and to just talk about, give us some insight on what, how to react, how to reach small business owners to get them into some of the properties on Montgomery Road. Um, and there's a, we've been through a long process, as I said, we started in June. And then hopefully by the end of February, the, the plan will be adopted by the council. Um, and just as a bit of background, you guys probably are familiar with the Norwood Com Quality of Life Plan or the Norwood Community Agreement um, but that was done by Norwood Together before it became Norwood Together in 2019. And I just wanted to mention that because one of the main, three main goals of this plan was a revitalization of Montgomery Road. So for us, we met with the mayor last, um, I guess, winter and talked to him about the possibility of uh, applying for this grant to get the plan done because it's one of our major goals. And I know it's one of the goals. This came from feedback from the community. So we're very proud and happy that we're moving here in this direction. And um, at this point, then, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve. If you have questions, uh, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to put it in the chat because of the way this is on my computer. So you can just ask and if Steve can't hear you, I'll forward them, you to him. So with all that said, Steve, it's your turn. Great. Uh, thank you, Mary C. And thank you, Councilman Gabbard, for uh, allowing me to speak to the Economic Development uh, Committee of Council. Uh, it's so important to circle back to this group. Uh, the impetus for this Montgomery Road uh, plan was to spur economic development in the corridor. And so we felt like it was incredibly important to, to come to you to get your feedback on the plan before adoption. Um, you're so lucky in Norwood to have such an active uh, government council and citizens like Mary C and the members of the steering committee. 
they were also a joy to work with. It's always fun to see people who are passionate about their community and passionate about improving it. So that was just great. And I think it bodes well for the future of the city. This plan rate lays out recommendations for public investment and the work of the community like Norwood together to draw back more private investment. That is the primary goal. So it might not be exactly what uh, folks anticipated this plan would be. There's not a lot in this plan about business recruitment. Uh, there's not a lot about a market study per se, but there is a lot that uh, has been successful in other places, particularly neighborhoods of the city of Cincinnati like Oakley, Pleasant Ridge, Walnut Hills, and places like that. I wanted to give a quick overview of the process and then go through this uh, overview of the plan and then that should take about 15 minutes or so, maybe 10, and uh, then uh, go to direct questions, suggestions, other input that we need to take before taking a final draft to the full council. Uh, Mary C. talked about it, uh, that in June of 2020, Norwood was awarded a planning grant for $30,000 of services. Uh, because of COVID, uh, those services were done through the county. In many other years, that often would be done through an RFP to the private consultant. In July and August, we held stakeholder interviews. Uh, Councilman Gabbard was one of those uh, that we interviewed. There are other folks, both with the city, with businesses, with outside developers, uh, with large stakeholders like UDF and Xavier to understand what they'd like to see in the corridor. In September, the steering team reviewed the initial recommendations and in October, they reviewed the final draft. In November, we had an open house right here in this room uh, at the community center. And uh, because of COVID, I think, and because uh, there aren't too many, uh, what I would say, controversial elements of the plan, um, we had very light attendance. I think we had maybe 20 or so um, um, representatives of the community there at that meeting. So we decided to try a, a virtual meeting in December uh, where we had two different times, one in the late afternoon and one in the early evening. Uh, we probably had a total of about 35 folks participate in those virtual open houses. We've been spending the month of January refining the plan with some of the input from the, those open houses. And then, as Mary C. said, in February, we'll be looking forward to going to the Planning Commission and then to the full council for adoption. I'm going to attempt to share my screen with the PowerPoint that I have. Um, let's see if that works. Mary C., is that working? It is. Uh, would someone want to, is the screen bothering you guys? Uh, could you? It looks like it slipped or something. Is it bothering? If it's not bothering you, we'll leave it. I can see as long as the font doesn't get any smaller. <laughs> you want to? Should we pull this back onto this table, the, the actual projector? Uh, oh, to the towards the table? That's probably a good idea. I understand what you're saying. I think if you move, push it towards the table, James, it might be a little bit bigger. Nope, it's getting smaller. That's the wrong direction. But so I did tighten this and lift it up. Might be a little better? Okay. We're all making it do. It is the focus of the kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, Steve, go for it. We'll do the best we can. I, think, I, I told them they could move if they wanted to. They could see. So. Very good. Again, thank you for uh, working with us uh, in the, these strange circumstances. Um, the first, the, there are five key elements of this plan. One is to invest in areas with existing momentum. The second is to improve basic infrastructure. The third is to emphasize east-west pedestrian connections across Montgomery Road to experiment, to activate what we call tactical urbanism in a planning field. And finally, to create a strategic framework for development. What do we mean by invest in areas with existing momentum? Well, when we did our review of the corridor, we noted that from City Hall down to Victory Park, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, clearly, with the new uh, Fidelity Center, uh, a lot of investment is going on from the private sector. We noted that the Anna's and the Bluebird restaurants are now being recreated. Uh, there's work being going on down at Victory Park. 
uh, to uh, refresh and, and, and fix it. So we saw that as a good opportunity. We don't, we think of the peanut butter uh, metaphor with this. It, the corridor is about one and a half miles long. If we try to invest evenly across the entire corridor, it will be just spreading a thin uh, piece, uh, layer of peanut butter across the entire corridor and not really emphasizing any area. We want to look to places where the private sector is already engaged and the city is already has assets and turn up the volume there uh, to make those exciting new places that will eventually spill over to the entire corridor. Some of the other areas that we think are already seeing investment are down at the Wasson Way. The library, the public library is slated for investment from the library itself. The Hudson Avenue intersection down by the fire museum and the UDF home office location. All of those locations are secondary locations that we think will have future investment. The next thing is to improve basic infrastructure. I don't think it's a secret that there's a lot of deferred maintenance along the Montgomery Road corridor. Basic improvements like updated signs, freshly painted poles could go a long way to sprucing up the corridor. This is particularly the case south of Monroe Avenue where there hasn't been a big suburban style redevelopment that like that happened in the northern part of the corridor. I've got some slides that show uh, what basic infrastructure improvement might look like. This is another community uh, further up Montgomery Road where you can see they have uh, new larger street signs, completely painted and uh, freshly painted uh, posts, uh, pedestrian lighting, uh, sidewalks that are clearly visible, trimmed trees and, and many trees uh, and many other amenities that make it a place for private investment and for pedestrians. Steve, are you trying yeah. to, are you, were you showing a picture there because we didn't get it? We just have your first slide up. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Let's try one more time. If not, you could, well, do you know what page it is in the plan? <laughs> no, no problem there. Let, just give me one second. Everybody has a computer. I could send you the Zoom link. Would that be better? If you have an extra copy, I mean, I can pull it up, but Mr. Gabbard, if you, do you have a copy already? Oh, never mind. Yeah, so if you tell me. Yeah, I <clears throat> tried to forward it all out to all of the users as well. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. The docs? Thank you. On the Google Docs? Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. You see the picture now? Yep. Yeah. Can I see it? There we go. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened, but that's good. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the thing, items I were talking about were the signs, uh, the, the poles are all painted, there's no flaking or rust or anything, the pedestrian lighting, the trees are all trimmed, and uh, if they got too big, they've been removed and replaced with appropriate sized trees. There's uh, pedestrian amenities like this crosswalk that's clearly demarked. Um, just a lot of things going on there that are, are a little different than the current shape of the, the Montgomery Road corridor in Norwood. The other item is emphasizing east-west pedestrian connections. Here we are further up in the northern part of the corridor across from Victory Park. This area was widened and is the equivalent of seven lanes across when you add the, uh, the median part and the parking on the sides. It just becomes a very difficult area to cross if you're a pedestrian. Making Montgomery Road act as a boundary in the community rather than a place to bring people together. Finding ways to make pedestrian movement across the street easier and safer is a goal of the plan. Locations that have been designated for pedestrian improvements include Sherman Avenue, Mills Avenue, Ashland Wanda Avenue, Williams Avenue, the Hudson Ivanhoe Avenue intersection, and Wasson Way. Here's an example in another city where they used bump outs and striping of crosswalks to help pedestrians get across. Experiment and activate tactical urbanism. These are low cost ways to test ideas before making a large capital investment and to energize and activate the community. 
More public spaces in the corridor could help bring people to the area and break up the sometimes relentless built environment. One place that the study identified that could have new life other than asphalt is the intersection of Lafayette Avenue and Montgomery Road, which is pictured here. Here's our, uh, an overhead view of what is possible at that intersection if it is temporarily closed. You could do uh, street painting with uh, either chalk or temporary paint, uh, outdoor dining, temporary outdoor dining, possibly food trucks, um, uh, all kinds of things could be happen here, perhaps like a, a little band or something. Uh, so that would be a temporary installation, relatively cheap to test before making the larger decision of potentially closing that section of Lafayette permanently. Other places that we are looking at for these tactical urbanism interventions include Heritage Park right next to City Hall, the top of the city parking garage, Central Park Fountain, the Prentice and Lindley Avenue area, and the Fire Museum at Ivanhoe Avenue. Lastly, we talked about creating a strategic framework for development. Again, I mentioned that the corridor is long and has different character uh, throughout the corridor. So we looked at breaking it up into eight sections, starting from the south, the Xavier University, what we're calling town and gown section, then a transition area between Xavier and the UDF campus, uh, the UDF campus, a uh, multifamily section where the Carpenter Flats building is and some other multifamily structures, relatively small section, another transi transition section up to Surrey Square, the shopping Surrey Square downtown section, city government jobs section toward the northern part of the corridor, and then the Norwood Lateral auto-oriented section by the Frishes uh, up by the lateral. In the plan, you'll find at, in an appendix uh, detailed recommendation maps uh, like this. Here you can see the proposed bump outs in, at the intersection of Ivanhoe and Hudson and Montgomery Road, the possibility of a, a new light that engineering studies would determine, uh, new streetscaping through additional street trees, bus pullouts in these brown areas, uh, planted median in the middle, and more uh, designated on-street parking uh, would be what was seen in this area. Also, ex more landscaping at the Xavier uh, Norwood Plaza location. One thing I want to point out in these uh, specific uh, recommendations that are heading toward preliminary engineering is that we, this plan does propose a three-lane section south of Monroe Avenue, permanent three-lane section. So right now, there is on-street parking except for peak hours. We would make that on-street parking permanent, in part because these bump-outs would be something that would limit travel in those lanes. So that's a pretty big change from what is currently uh, happening out on Montgomery Road. There are also a couple spots where we're changing one-way streets back to two-way. Uh, some of those are mostly in the northern part of the corridor, like in the Elm and Maple Avenue area. There's also traffic signal ch per changes proposed in this plan. The removal of the traffic signal at Frisch's, potentially one of the uh, signals at Elm or Maple. Uh, we talked a little bit about the signal at Lafayette and possibly the, the addition of a signal here at Ivanhoe and Hudson. So those are some of the major uh, proposed recommendations in the plan that uh, might be something to highlight to uh, your constituents. How do we get this plan done? Well, it's, we think partnerships are the big piece of it. Uh, we've had great participation from Xavier and UDF, and they are uh, willing to make some of the changes that are in this plan. Uh, I mentioned the public library is, is ready to invest in the Norwood branch. We continue to want to help through things like community development block grants uh, through the county. The Ohio Department of Transportation is doing other studies throughout the corridor and does have money for safety improvements that could help fund some of these changes. HCDC through Catherine Fitzgerald is also a partner and with them located in Norwood, they can also help with many of these recommendations. And finally, Metro is a big player along this corridor with three routes they go up and down Montgomery Road through this section. With the levy that was passed for Metro, they could also help with some of the improvements along the corridor. 
Mary C, let you know where we're going next uh, after this Economic Development Committee meeting. Uh, we have to go to the Planning Commission and then to the Council and then on to implementation. That's the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, I'd love to try to answer them now. Steve, can you take, yeah, there you go. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I suppose that I, when you come back to Council, what I spoke to another member on the steering committee, it seemed like the aim was to get a resolution passed as the best way of our council's adoption of the plan. Uh, did you want to agree, comment? Was that the end goal? Yes. Yeah. Um, with that said, I think the something that I think would be particularly interesting to some of the council members is how much safety uh, is actually going to be an outcome from this. Um, not and and I think even CB said it, it was little on direct. Uh, investment incentive and more on if I make it really safe for folks people will want to be there sort of mindset and I don't know if that was hot that struck me and I didn't know if you wanted to highlight that for for folks at home even more it seemed like a huge kind of sale point yeah sell point rather for uh, I would point. say that and um, beautification that really to try to improve the looks of Montgomery Road but we talked about a lot of things, and Steve, you can comment on this too. Um, some people wanted bike lanes, but when we tried to put bike lanes in, it just felt like it was gonna be like a bike lane on this block and a bike lane on this block. And so when we talked about it, the um, comment that was made in the steering committee was, you know, we really don't need bike lanes on Montgomery Road. We need safe ways to get across Montgomery Road. That I would never send my kids on their bikes to Watson Way by themselves across Montgomery Road, this person said. And so- and it was well, the crossing that was the problem, right? Crossing Montgomery Road. So that's why there's a lot of emphasis on the bump outs, the crosswalks being maintained and replaced, um, things like that, because that was a big issue, especially because they want to get there and they want to use Victory Park. I mean, they want to get use the park, they want to get to the library, they want to get to Watson Way, sure. and don't feel like it's safe at this point in time. So, Steve, did you want to comment on that? Uh-oh, we lost uh -oh. it again, Eric. Steve, did you want to comment on safety? Can you hear me? Uh-oh, hopefully it didn't. I don't know if it's an internet issue or a... You can just close that out, I think, because that's my meetings. Here, let's see. Let's do this. Let's close this one. Yeah. See if we can get it. Steve Johns is the host now. I'm, I'm back. Okay, we can't there. see you though. There you are. Okay, you're good. Did you did you lose? Did we lose you? I think I got frozen on your end. So. Okay, I think you did. So, uh, uh, did you hear what we said? He, um, Eric's question was about safety and the impact okay. on safety across Montgomery Road. Do you want to make any comments on that? Yes, uh, we heard loud and clear from um, definitely the public that safety is a huge concern, uh, particularly for pedestrians crossing Montgomery Road. And the idea of these bump outs, uh, the idea of limiting the number of lanes of travel uh, and will help reduce speeds and uh, make the crossing safer particularly for pedestrians and cyclists and, and, and folks like that. There's also a lot of research about parking on the road, that if there's parking on the road, the people walking on the sidewalks feel safer, which is why we've added parking, permanent parking along the um, Montgomery Road. Um, and that it, it seems like with the traffic signaling and the studies, it really wouldn't slow down traffic. I mean, it would slow traffic to the speed it's supposed to be, but it wouldn't cause more traffic issues if it's done correctly. So. That's kind of the idea. Understood. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Any other questions, James? Uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I'm looking through the plan now, and uh, I'll say it's way more detailed than I was expecting it to be, which is, I think, a great thing. I mean, not, of course, we're not going to be able to do everything in here, right? Uh, but the fact that there's these, uh, there's so many suggestions, again, about the traffic lights. I mean, actually safety, kind of uh, linking up the fire department with the two traffic signals at Maple and Elm to, you know, give them extra time of no traffic to get out of there. I mean, 
lots of great ideas, things that uh, I think uh, could definitely be implemented. So just want to thank you all for that. Uh, I definitely think the Montgomery Road idea of going kind of doing the road diet where you have the permanent center turn lane and then the two uh, the lanes in each direction. I mean, so many other communities have, have done this road diet and to amazing success. And, you know, there's a few intersections I think we'll have to look at, probably like the Lafayette-Hopkins intersection because there's just you know, so many different signal entrances to it that, uh, you know, just making sure that traffic just doesn't get bottlenecked. But overall, though, I think it's very, uh, many of these things seem very feasible. Uh, so I'm definitely excited to uh, see how we can, uh, you know, potentially get some of these things in our capital improvement plan. So. Um, There's a, if you look at the there's somewhere, I don't know what page it's on, Steve. Do you know where the um, rendering is of the Lafayette intersection? You have to know off the top of your head. There's a picture of kind of an idea of how the tactical yes. urbanism could be used at that corner to kind of to change it and sure. then make it less light changes there that people have to sit through and also safer for pedestrians because it's such, that's, that's like 180 feet there or something like that. It's a huge intersection to walk across. Uh, yeah, so that, the rendering is on page 20 in the plan. Yeah, and then the block there where the fire zone is, there's no crosswalk to that block at this point in time. So um, as one of the business owners there said to me, it's like falling off a cliff. I mean, like it's just an empty block there and there's no yeah. place. So. Um, so the plan tries to address a lot of those issues. But, um, and the best thing to really to look at if you want to see the details is the, are the maps, and the maps are in the appendix, right, Steve? That's correct. Yeah. And they- Yeah, so these road diets have become quite a fad. Uh, Springfield Pike in Wyoming just recently went uh, under a road diet where they went from four lanes to three lanes uh, with the idea that, uh, that that turn lane helps people from having those rear end collisions as people try to make a left and people are trying to pass at the same time. Um, and so they actually have more traffic on that road uh, according to the uh, traffic count. So if they're able to go to that three lane section, I'm, I'm very confident. Uh, and I think the engineers will agree that um, Montgomery Road can do it too. That's great. The other yes, How does sir. the new uh, proposed um, movement of the VW thing play into this plan? Does it at all? Um, on the map, if you find that site, it really asks right now that, first of all, we eliminate the curb cut on Montgomery Road. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an, another safety issue, especially because of the entrance to Wasson Way. But the only recommendation of the plan is that um, the Joseph owners uh, tear down the building and maintain the property. So I believe, right, Steve? That the only, only um, about the Joseph property is the curb cut and that they demolish that building and maintain the property in some way, clean up the property. That, that's correct. So we have a, a section called remove eyesores and we feel like that Norfolk Southern, uh, the former building that is on that site is one of those eyesores that looks abandoned and needs to be removed as soon as possible. Uh, so that is a you know, definitely a short-term recommendation for that site. We'd, we'd love for that uh, development to meet the current zoning standards uh, to bring that building closer to the street uh, if they are going to proceed with the, uh, the dealership. Um, and then definitely the curb cut that Mary C. talks about. That curb cut uh, would be really close to the Wasson Way uh, and, and could potentially be dangerous for that crossing. Um, we... we uh, talked a fair bit about not trying to dive too deeply into that one particular issue uh, because we are dealing with a 1.5 mile corridor and didn't want to get bogged down on one particular site. But we did say, as Steve said, to make sure that if whatever you decide that the, they do follow the form-based code. And so, anyway, James. Yeah, I also like the idea too in here, um, if for some reason that dealership you know, I guess if it does end up moving, um, you know, you all recommended that we take the, the opportunity to align uh, Clinton Avenue basically on both sides to match up together. And mm -hmm. I do think that's a great idea and probably will help kind of traffic flow there too if you can have the greens at the same time uh, mm -hmm. by doing that. So uh, yeah, anyways, I, like I said, there's just so many of these little mini, like small recommendations, but they'll have big impacts and they're scattered throughout this thing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, I'm excited to get this thing online so that we can share it with our constituents and let them see it as well. I think there's, th is it three road alignments in there? 
the it was the um, uh, Allison and Wanda no Ashlyn and Wanda the uh, that realignment yes yeah. is proposed um, up, up by the old um, train station there um, and then the um, the one that you were talking about and the Clinny and was there one more or oh, Lafayette reconfiguring was the other big yeah. one Maybe yes there's some minor changes at Ivanhoe that we uh, have suggested as well. Right. So yes. where do we where do we go with this from now? I mean, um, is it who who makes the decisions on we we like the whole plan? We want to put ideas in, and we don't really like this or that. I mean, so, what, Steve, did you hear that? I did. So how does this get implemented, right? That's a big uh, piece. There's, there's things that are uh, low cost, like the temporary potential change at Lafayette, which, you know, you do it for a weekend, doesn't work out, it was a thousand bucks, you know, not, not too big a deal. Um, there's already a safety study going on uh, from ODOT, uh, and I actually know the um, consultant that's working on that. So they might take little pieces from this plan, uh, certain intersections, and then recommend improvements from there. So it's probably going to be the old how to eat the elephant. Uh, Montgomery Road is a is a big project, as we've outlined. Uh, it's going to be challenging to do it all in one fell swoop. So looking at these opportunities to do little pieces at a time to continue the momentum, I think the big piece that I've uh, heard the mayor and administration talk about is that Montgomery Road needs to be resurfaced at some point. Uh, that would be the point to do a lot of the major changes that are imagined uh, to try to fold in um, the medians, the bump outs, um, the bus pads, all, all the hard concrete capital items that are going to cost a lot of money. Um, and that might have to be done in phases where in our estimation, the section south of Monroe, again, is the part that is really in need of the most help. So perhaps that is the first section that gets phased in as money is available. That's something that I would um, suggest that uh, you as council members and uh, the staff, hopefully, for the city can look to some sort of uh, way to incorporate these recommendations into the capital budgeting process. Uh, so that we can slowly but surely have money allocated to move these projects forward. So, okay. Steve, I think also part of the question was if if they had comments of things I know that they things they don't like or things they think should be changed at this point. What should they do? Ah, uh, yes, uh, I would send an email to me and Mary C. Um, we want to. We are in a position to refine this in the next three steps, right? So if you guys have uh, comments as an economic development committee, we want to get them incorporated as soon as possible so that we're moving towards something that will be ready for adoption by the time we get the council. So we would ideally like to have your comments as soon as possible, uh, maybe end of the week um, would, if that would work, mm -hmm. so that we can make those changes and so that the next version we show to planning commission incorporates the things that um, you see need to be changed. So just to give you a heads up, so I, at, at all the public meetings, people made suggestions, mm -hmm. and those have already been incorporated and changed in the plan okay. from what? Well, and Mary Sue, uh, I think this is the uh, caveat we keep bringing up. Some people were getting ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they were talking about detailed design pieces uh, that um, will come out in the engineering studies. Um, we don't know exactly what the, the bump outs are going to look like. We don't know exactly what kind of landscaping is going in certain places. Uh, so uh, this is something planners get accused of. We kind of plan to say, let's do some more planning, right? So um, uh, for instance, at Victory Park, we realized that uh, it would be uh, ideal to have hire a landscape architect to do a full-blown master plan for that site. Uh, there's a lot of interest in there so this plan uh, calls that out that that plan that park could use a, um, a redo maybe uh, but we don't want to go too far in saying how that redo is going to be done um, because that's out of our level of expertise 
so like for example the the little heritage park by the city hall that was something that was recommended by the plan and especially because of covid so there'd be outdoor seating for the restaurants so and they've already received funding for that through a grant through hamilton county so there was covid money that was extra so i think that if you guys for the most part like the council for the most part likes the plan then hopefully it will direct the spending for things like that park or things like the re the uh, landscape architect for for victory park um i think so many people felt like that area is like what would be norwood's downtown let's make it look like norwood's downtown a place where people you know feel proud of when they're down there so um so that's kind of hopefully what the plan will do is direct that spending like um, steve said influence the capital uh, budget so well and we're hopeful that uh, there will be grants too so it won't all just be uh, city money I, I could see something like uh, victory park being something that uh, norwood together could help find foundation dollars or, or things like that to help with the design part it's the implementation part that often falls on uh, the city funds and, and state and federal funds as well and like for roads too i think there's money being sought to redo Re montgomery road i'm not sure how long it'll take to get it but i know that i think it's being looked for so anybody else you guys have Steve's email because I could, or you can get it. I'm sure Hamilton County Planning. Um, yeah, it's in that email too that you sent to Gabbard, uh, Donardo, Thompson, and I. Uh, okay. So it's yeah in the body of it. Oh yeah, there you go. I forgot about that. Anything else, Eric? You got any comments? I, I think it looks really cool. I. Uh, need a little time to digest it i was uh, got yeah. it today and was, I was looking through it while i could but I, I i think you're making great great thought out recommendations i i uh, i appreciate that the you've kind of gone through and and prioritized a little bit um what we'd be looking at um yeah just interested in in moving it forward really yeah, the, the one thing i would just a question i have just so that we can just make it clear does does us council voting like our resolution to a, to adopt or support the plan does this mean that like it's our intention that every single thing in here gets done or is it more just are we supporting the overall goal that it's striving to do i mean do you have an opinion on that my opinion right so oh, okay. i think of this uh, similar to how you would adopt a comprehensive plan right uh, often those documents back in the day were very long, had kind of almost a, uh, a grab bag of ideas, like everything, you know, it's comprehensive, right? So, um, and uh, cities would adopt them usually, you know, not by ordinance or anything, but just by resolution. And so say that, yes, conceptually, we agree that this is the way forward, but it's not binding and to say, wow, we have to do everything in this plan. That, that's where it comes down to the council and the administration on um, which pieces you pick, which makes sense now. It, it just gives you a pathway forward. And your resolution is, is saying that, uh, you know, in general, we're behind this plan, right? So it, it gives uh, kind of a green light to the administration to move forward with elements of it. So um, not binding, not legally binding, uh, kind of a way to, to show momentum and show that, uh, hey, here's a a guide, a roadmap, uh, no pun intended, for this corridor um, that you can always look back to and not have to reinvent the wheel every time you're looking at one particular element of this corridor. That's perfect. Okay, that, that answers a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was looking at the, uh, kind of the same way that this would be a roadmap for us um, because, you know, there might be things in here that the plan says, hey, this would, this would really look good in this particular section but you know the city doesn't have funds to to put in their budget so you know it has to be tweaked but it gives us kind of a guideline a road map to look at um hey this this would probably look good in this area let's uh let's start crunching numbers on this you know whether it's the parks or you know streets or street realignments 
those kind of things. The islands, you know, I really like the islands um, and the, the real wide sections that we have. I would like to see the islands come all the way up, just maybe a little bit, like incorporate the, the, the crosswalk through the island. Right. So you, there's kind of a buffer on both sides of the crosswalk, um, those kind of things. If I'm not mistaken, back in the early part of this decade when, um, when, when Montgomery Road was last um, resurfaced, there was uh, the thought of putting those islands in then, and a lot of infrastructure was kind of put in place, whether it's water lines to use for irrigation and those kind of things. I don't know 100%, but I, I think I recall that because I was on council back then, and uh, but we just never ended up putting islands in. But you know, it's those kind of things that that we could look at. One of the things I'm not real big on is like uh, I think your in the recommendation was to change mills to back to a two way. I I wouldn't be a, uh, in favor of that at all. I, I I like mills just being a one way next to the park there. Um, although, you know, your other recommendation down by, say, um, I could see keeping maybe Elm one way, but maybe not Maple, um, at least that last block, that first block by, by there. I like maybe eliminating that light at Maple, keeping the one right there at Elm, because uh, we, we th those, especially those lights are not lined up or engineered right. You stop at every single one going through. Um, but you know, there's just a few you know, different things like that. But in, in, in general, I, I think that the plan looks pretty well. There's a lot of great ideas. Um, just for point of clarification, on the, the part where Lafayette comes in at Cameron and Montgomery Road, is the plan to, to experiment with like blocking off Lafayette altogether and just having Cameron come in and then, then Lafayette would just be a dead end there. But you could use that last block since there's not much there as almost an entertainment thing. Correct. See, this is where I'm confused on the picture. That, that looks like Lafayette and it's not stopped. Well, yes. Not That's yeah, uh, at Lafayette, we wanted to take advantage both of the sorter right away yeah. uh, right. and all that pavement there. And because that makes that intersection so awkward. Yeah. Um, you know, when I have been on Montgomery Road, I think it's nearly 60 seconds that you have to wait uh, through that series of lights that, to all work together. Mm -hmm. and, and that's coming, creating some of the um, kind of congestion in the area and I think some frustration on the drivers. Uh, oh, so yeah. um, that, it was both uh, trying to look at a way to simplify that intersection, take advantage of all that space that's there, um, and then also try to create some pedestrian safety on that east side uh, of Montgomery Road to make that crossing easier. Yeah, I like that. I, and to the uh, point of... Um, uh, you know, how does council take this and move forward? I, I think uh, a big piece would be looking for you to help prioritize this. Uh, like I was saying, if you tried to do all this at once, it, it is in the millions easily of dollars to do it all. Um, but you guys know the community better than I do and helping to find out what makes sense uh, first um, and then also being opportunistic to know, hey, if there's funding available for certain pieces of the plan, move those forward first instead of trying to wait for the whole shebang. I had a, a quick question. Um, I, I, I'm just, I don't know the answer to this, but our neighbors in St. Bernard recently did something like this through their town, um, and it made a world of difference in the way that the Vine Street, I think, there looks at, up and down. Um, but do you know, was that done with a plan like this? How did they get the funding for, for that? Because they're a very small community as well. Do you know, I didn't know if you happen to know or not. A, a similar plan in St. Bernard. Yeah, so I, I think they did use some of their community development block grant money for that, um, but they also are in a better uh, financial position than, than Norwood, I believe. They, they do run um, uh, excess generally uh, year to year. Uh, you know, their big industrial piece, Procter & Gamble for them, is still there. So. Um, 
they, then I think they have um, a little bit more cash to do those kind of things. Um, then my understanding is of, with Norwood kind of being a tighter budget. It makes sense. Yeah. It doesn't mean it can't still be a goal to get and one step at a time. It's like Steve said, eating the elephant. So. Mm -hmm. um, Gabby, the, the thing about Lafayette, too, is where they wanted to do the tactical urbanism. In other words, a temporary blockage to see mm -hmm. how it would work, which and, and put the entertainment and the food trucks and all that there and have like, you know, like a community block party or something right. at that spot. Yeah. Um, which would be kind of cool. I like trying to, to, to do it as a temporary basis and then that way you're not out a bunch of money if it, it doesn't seem to work. Yeah. I like that. All right. uh, the city parking garage, are we talking about the old GM parking garage? Yes. Yeah. I could see I think one, of your, <laughs> one of your comments was about uh, maybe it being difficult to get food trucks up on that top deck but uh, because of the height uh, of getting up and down those ramps inside there. Um, but if, if they could, that, I mean, that's a cool idea to, you know, a lot of places downtown, uh, it's real popular to have the rooftop bars and uh, cafes and such. And to be able to do something like that up there, that's, that's kind of an exciting uh, new venture. Yes, it seemed like a, a very underutilized asset right now. Uh, and so trying to think of some creative ways to use it yeah. makes a lot of sense to me. We heard some from the public at our December meetings that uh, there are some concerns about safety and lighting at that facility. Um, but, um, you know, when I've checked it and I checked over there during COVID time, so it's probably not fair to say, but it looks like it's fairly underutilized. I would agree. So one comment too, back to the one ways. Um, I don't know when they were made, those roads were made one way, but I was told that it had something to do with the plant, people exiting from the plant and uh, causing traffic to jam up. And so they made the roads one way. And so it may or may not be necessary anymore. And I also heard that Mills was one way because with, of the safety lane at one time. So. You know, the question becomes, and that would be like a traffic study to see if it would even work, or an engineering study. Mm -hmm. But why are they one way? Is and they are narrow roads. Mm -hmm. That's the other piece. So yeah, yeah. And the thing about the mills one, uh, the, the mills, I do think there's opportunity there because it's going to by making it two way. Except just even if you do it just to uh, Walter, it could open up additional uses for the safety lane because uh, to make it easier to get to. So like I've, I've heard a couple. There's a couple of groups out there that might want to redevelop it one day. So having it two-way could just make it easier again just for people to get to it. Not that that's a necessary thing, but uh, if, if the traffic study works, there's a potential I see that that might benefit the, mm -hmm. the traffic flow to get to it. A lot of potential for that area. So, uh, so uh, just one last question for me, and I won't ask any more. Let's say that we, uh, I mean, this is, I'm so glad that we, we we have what we have here, and you know, if there's modifications, that's that's great. But uh, what if we want to take it to the the next part of Montgomery Road, right? Um, I know that we, I don't know if we'll get necessarily a grant to do that, but I mean, can the city, does does Hamilton County Planning, can the city contract with Hamilton County Planning to do one? You know, maybe it probably wouldn't be as extensive because it's a little bit less dense up there. But uh, if we wanted to do the next part, is is that something that we could do if that's kind of the intention? So, Steve, did you hear that question? So going north of the lateral and doing the rest of the corridor. And number and can, could they contract with Hamilton County to do that? Uh, yes, we do contract with jurisdictions to do this kind of work. Um, there are a lot of good uh, consultants out there that could also do this kind of work. Um, I would say we're a little slower maybe than uh, some of the consultants out there because you know they're on to the next project. But the benefit is that we're not going away, right? We're, we're, we're here and we're always going to be interested in doing work in Norwood, um, being you know, one of our largest cities in the county. Um, so yes, uh, the answer is yes. We would be interested and available to discuss that. And in fact, there will be another round of mini grants coming up. Um, so potentially it, that could even be funded. Yeah, that might be something to really to look at. I, I would say kind of anecdotally, you know, don't only to this uh, 100%, but 
We, the lot of county staff is very excited about the new energy in Norwood and uh, we're, we uh, have been looking at Norwood for a long time and, and really are wanting to help in whatever way we can. Yeah, I, and I just think that, I mean, I think this is awesome. I think that there's going to be things that we can really implement now. I just want to continue the momentum, too, because I think having the same kind of plan for north of the lateral is going to give us then that blueprint to be able to do investment up there as well. It's, it's going to look different. It's not going to be the same, of course. It, there's a lot more multifamily. You've got some more big institutions up there. But uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity as well. So, um, yeah, I'm, thank you for that answer. I'm, well, I'll be following up. And if we did use the county, there'd be consistency. Oh yeah, that's great. Because yeah. of this part, you'd want it to be consistent with what we're hoping to do uh, that area as well. Uh, Thank you. This was the long amount, though. I mean, this was the long corridor to oh, yeah. to do the redevelopment plan for. So okay. I think there's a lot of things that can be done in this particular plan in this section that we're looking at um, that you know don't necessarily. Uh, cost us an arm and a leg or, or put a major hit on the budget by doing things like painting the poles and new signage and um, you know some new um, signaling um, upgrading some uh, crosswalk areas and things like that just that little bit of beautification can go a long way and then you know you start looking at adding um, you know, landscaping in, in certain ways. Uh, you pointed out a couple areas where, you know, even business frontages, mm -hmm. it, they could just be cleaned up or, you know, maybe just redone a little bit. Not much, right. but just a little bit would go a whole long way in, in really beautifying that whole corridor. So there's a lot of things that can be done like that yeah. that aren't going to, you know, put a major hit to our budget. Well, in a couple, I don't know if you noticed, like one of the recommendations is to have the signs that are broken, you know, like at Norwood Plaza, taken down. Yeah. You know, the sign of the Quality Inn, taken down. Um, and potentially, you know, move the chain link on Montgomery Road, you know, mm -hmm. replace that with something else that would be a lot more attractive than right. chain link or something like that. So those things are, you know, they're doable, yeah. right? So. Any other comments or questions for Steve? All right, thank you thank guys. You very much. Well, thank you all very much. Um, just, you've got your his email address, so and my email address. So if you have any comments, please do send them because we want to incorporate everybody's idea in, in what we do. So. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Steve, thank you, thank Steve. You. Thank you, and thanks so much for allowing me to uh, present in this manner. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all your time that you give to the city. Uh, again, it's such an important part of Hamilton County. We're proud to be doing work in Norwood. Well, we appreciate you being flexible and working with us in this format. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Very cool. Um, next up, we have uh, PKL. PLK. I forgot how we get it backwards. Which one is Whatever it? Whatever you want to call it. Yeah? PLK. All right. My bad. Um, they're going to give us kind of an overview little uh, thing because they're really going to be presenting to uh, you guys on finance here next. But uh, give us uh, just kind of a, a quick little overview. Back your way. told not to use the cities. <laughs>
And again, my apologies, I was, we were confused about this while we were presenting that. Do you want me to see it or sit okay? Does it you can sit down there. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So again, my name is Nick Langenfelter. I'm VP of Development for PLK Communities. Um, many of you have heard from us before, so all we're going to do tonight is just on the development side, give you a quick idea of what's changed in the plans since the last time, and a quick uh, update on the economic impact numbers. And then what we'll do at the finance portion is specifically discuss the ask and the CRA. So. Some brief updates we're gonna cover on here are just the changes to the preliminary plan. What is the current phase one? And then again, what's the economic impact? So, since the last time you all saw the plan and today, we did have some major changes. Um, as you get into the design, you, you further refine it, there's certain things that make more sense. So, the largest change we made was we detached the clock tower. So, if you haven't seen the updated renderings, this is the updated rendering to the entrance right now. That clock tower is actually an independent structure and will remain independent. Um, we have a separate building behind it and they're no longer attached given the differences in floor heights and a lot of structural issues there. So um, we also restored the turnaround so that Park Avenue has that turnaround that was always historically there. We're looking to recreate some type of water feature at the entrance that had always historically been at the site and just give it that nice grand feel as you're coming in. Finally, our original plans called for the brewery and tap room to be at the front of the property. That has now moved to the center. And the reason why is it makes a lot more sense to have that be the central hub of what the development is versus just having the front and then nobody comes to the back of the project. There's a significant amount of investment going to the back, office going to the back, and we want everything to be centrally located so that we have one retail hub versus two kind of spheres of retail throughout the development. Um, the second thing is, you can kind of see here, we've shadowed in where the office buildings are. We have a larger mixed-use building now on the park. So we moved the family park to the rear. Originally, the family park was actually behind the factory. And I'll show you why we did that in a bit. But it just kind of felt like an afterthought. So now the family park sits up here in the middle. And uh, we've got some splash pads and other things like that as well for families. Um, the other thing is that we did is we removed what we call the overbuilt units on the factory. So. We wanted to go up three to four stories on top of the factory. Unfortunately, due to no structural records, they won't let us do that without reinforcing the entire building with steel. The building is already very expensive to restore even into a garage, um, but we will be doing some lofted units on the fourth floor. So this fourth floor rooms go from 17 feet to 22 feet in the center. So we'll be able to have lofted units on the fourth floor that look down onto the park and the other areas. Um, and there'll be some very nice units. So some of the highest in on the whole development but we won't be able to build actually on top of the property. So, well, like I can say one of the big changes here is we originally planned 16 townhomes in the middle, um, but you can see now it's graded. We want to do a mixed use building, and this mixed use building will be significantly more expensive and larger. So from a tax base standpoint, it makes more sense to build a larger building. It's also the most valuable pad on the site. When you really get down to where's the office on the highway, where's the central activity here, what we didn't want to do was create townhomes where people were worried about noise or there's too much going on outside and all of a sudden that's right outside your front door. Um, we're envisioning anywhere between 80 and 100 residential units in here in some capacity with ground floor retail, kind of finishing that out. Um, if we don't go residential, we have had significant interest from office tenants and we would actually look at putting an office tenant there if we could get the right tenant. There's a lot of technology businesses out there that are looking for that high activity that actually might want to be in that spot more than the actual highway spot. So we're leaving that flexible at this point. Um, we have so many residential units coming online in the first phase anyway, between 250 and 300 units, that it doesn't make sense to build it yet. Let's go ahead and build this plan out and then decide what goes on that site later. So um, finally, the Food Innovation Hub, which you can see in the bottom left, that's the original building that used to sit up on Beach Street. So we've added an addition to that. So we've been working with Jobs Ohio to actually make that Food Innovation Hub larger. Uh, we're working on a $2 million grant to help subsidize that expansion, but that will allow us to go to 18 re restaurant type style startup tenants. Um, whether that's some type of the next smoothie shop or something else, it allows us to make a larger hub that becomes more central. That will actually be about 50% of the retail built in the first phase. So in phase one, there's about 40,000 square feet. That makes up 19,000 square feet of the development now. Pretty significant number. By the time you got the brewery and that food innovation hub, we're about 70% pre-leased, or will be before we uh, start development. <coughs> um, <coughs> finally, again, this highlighted here is everything that's in phase one. So all of this will be built, all the central infrastructure will be built. The parking garage, which is the factory to the north, 
the Food Innovation Hub, your center corridor and green space. You can now see the brewery dead center right in the middle of the project where it needs to be. And then the residential buildings to the south. When we actually build this out, we will be building this center corridor building as well as we call the Beach Street buildings down here, uh, Beach and Kenilworth. And then we'll also be building the residential on top. So you'll see this whole residential corridor here completed in the first phase. It'll be delivered over about nine to 12 months. Um, we don't want to deliver again all the product at once or you're going to flood the market and it'll be a detriment to all of us. Um, and again, you'll have this centralized pad here at the end of the day where we have the townhomes, 16 townhomes, a much larger building, office, other type of revenue sources, made more sense. What we did lay out is do we move the townhomes to the southern pad? What else do we do? We just don't know. So these two pads here are what we're calling phase 1B. So when we get to the finance portion, you'll hear me say A and B. All of this is in phase one. These are just 24 to 36 months behind. Um, and again, the food innovation hub. So what I talked about here was we are working on how do we get a bike trail extension? Um, I know that we're looking at some other options, some of the stuff that you guys are doing. Is there a way that we can kind of create a spur down to this point? So what we have committed to do is actually build an extension all the way to the property, then down to the lower bridge. We're building it anyway. We might as well make it accessible. And then if we ever do get the extension, it's already there. What we will do across here, this is the dog park to the north, and then you actually have bike trail store, uh, bike storage. So outdoor bike storage here, indoor bike storage on those two, and resident bike storage as well on that building. So we try to make sure we have pedestrian connectivity. Um, when we did our traffic studies, and we did a pretty significant one, was brought up to us was actually the internal traffic is more than the external traffic. So when you start thinking about that, you know, you have a couple hundred residents here at minimum. At some point, they're saying five to seven hundred residents could really live here. Up to four hundred employees could work here. The internal traffic to all your retail and as well, just to even walk to lunch, is actually greater than some of the other traffic. So, what we've done is we actually have six crosswalks just across the main street. How do we do that? You see the curb extensions or the bump outs, as they refer to them. So, we, we've tried to make sure this is as pedestrian friendly internally as well as to the neighborhood when we do it. So. Some brief high-level numbers. Um, Jobs Ohio helped us create these, so I apologize if they look off. I, I, it's not usually what I would do is estimate the jobs. We're estimating about phase one construction jobs, about 180 full-time jobs. Just so you all are aware too, we're working with the Port Authority, as many of you know. Um, as part of that, we target a 72% inclusion. What that means is we will target 72% of our, all of our contracts to WBE, MBE, and SBE related entities. So um, priority is given to those entities and ultimately it's a competitive bid process, but we'll do special things like for minor, minority business, we might go advertise in a certain newspaper. We might make sure that we're bringing in other opportunities that we're spreading those around to all groups within Norwood. So full-time jobs on the office, this is assuming a 200,000 square foot office, whether it's one building or two, two 100s, it's roughly 400 jobs. So uh, full-time payroll right now is looking at about $20 million annually once those offices are built out. Again, we're phasing this. We have to phase a lot of the infrastructure. So what makes that a little difficult is we have, this property has no sewers, it has no water, it has nothing to those highways. So as part of phase one, what we're going to be asking in the next meeting is you know, how do we fund that infrastructure with a TIF from our taxes that we are paying? This is a project TIF. It will not be funded by anybody around us. It will be specifically funded by our development and the taxes we would have paid. But again, we have to build that out or we won't have any office pads and office jobs to bring in. So um, then part-time jobs, this is almost purely the Food Innovation Hub, it's about 100 to 120 jobs, and we're anticipating another 50 to 75 in addition to that on the ancillary retail that will come. Um, annual retail sales is estimated for phase one, so this is roughly that 30 to 40,000 square feet at 12 to 15 million dollars a year. So some pretty significant sales numbers there. So with that, I uh, will take questions. Yeah. Uh, you know, Yo, good. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I was just curious, uh, what do you plan on, so we've got the future office footprint. Uh -huh. um, what ha What is your intention to happen there in the meantime? Like what happens with it? Is that, is that just a grassy area right now? So right now, about two thirds of that's paved. So during construction, that's our laydown site. So we actually, it's pretty expensive to build a laydown site. We have to have a lot of material stored. So during the construction period, we're gonna leave the asphalt parking lot that's there. It's to be determined what we will do afterwards. Do we just leave it as some surface space? Um, we're gonna have to deal with some detention as well. So we have some underground detention, a lot of it's contained in the park, and then some of it will be contained up in that area. And then as the office building comes online, because we don't know what that is. So what I will say is we've broken this up into two phases. 
uh, on purpose. A large corporate tenant comes in and wants an office garage, garage, parking garage, everything else. This is exempt from any type of TIF there. So what that'll do is maybe they need to make their detention different. So we're trying to leave that space flexible because we don't want to build it out and all of a sudden you've got not enough capacity for potential tenant that might be coming in. So for the most part it will be detention and we'll probably just leave the surface lot there unless it's too bad. Gotcha. Yeah, well that's, well, that's the, really the question. So my concern, I mean, so when you say surface lot, so then would that be tenants that would be, would that be people that would be living in some of those residential units that no. potentially be parking there? No. What would, be, what would be the surface lot be used for? So I mean, that, that might be you have market hall, you might have an event going on, or just overflow. Like, what I would tell you is as far as your residential in phase one, all your residential is to this side of the property. So if they're parking over here, that's a really far walk. So the parking for phase one will be contained in these southern lots as well as this main building parks in the parking garage. So the majority of your residents are actually sitting over here. It would be way too cumbersome for the majority. Like, they probably won't walk that distance. We have a typical travel distance that a resident would walk that we usually use as a calculation. Gotcha. So I mean, my concern would be though that so and, and so hopefully we can maybe work something into this final thing just to make sure that this doesn't happen. I don't want to see any of that extra phase there used at parking for any kind of permanent parking for the other areas because I don't want it, I don't want PLK to get comfortable mm -hmm. with that and then potentially not have as much of an incentive to get that developed in the office because you're losing parking that residents are going are currently using uh, in your earlier phases. To that, what I can tell you is phase one is a break-even proposition. The money on this development is made in phase two because the amount of infrastructure we have to put in. We're putting in almost $20 million in infrastructure, of which we'll hear about the TIF ask later. The TIF ask can't even cover half of it. So as a company, if we don't get to those pads, we basically don't make any money. Now, yes, we'll break even, but it, like I say, it's break even. The majority of the value is in that future phase of land, but we have to develop the site to get to that future land. So it would not be in our best financial interest to leave that as a parking lot. Okay. So where, where is the people that come to the brewery and to the, uh, the, the market, the food market, the innovation market, uh, are they going to be in the parking, in the parking garage? In the garage, yeah. I'm trying to see if I got a different angle on this one, guys, but I don't. I apologize. No, you're so the garage itself yeah. um, is four stories. So your first three stories fit about 100 to 122 cars per floor. The main building on the park is 119 units, the majority of which are ones. So you don't have a ton of parking there. You are going to have some, but the majority of the first floor is going to be all public parking. So you're talking, you're probably first floor and second half of your second floor, 150 to 175 public spaces. Plus then you're also going to have surface spaces to the rear. And you're going to have all these surface spaces here on both sides. We will likely pave this portion some point in the beginning. So we have overflow if we need it. Okay. And then your, um, this back, this back section were for office. Mm -hmm. um, is there, I'm, I, I guess I'm a little, I, I look at this both ways. Number one, if you have the, the office of buildings like you have it, and then the parking towards the expressway, that, that gives a buffer to everything. But then I would think that that office space would want to be out there on the edge with a lot of view from the highway. I don't think you're going to lose that visibility. And the reason why I say that is um, a couple things. Typically, your office tenants want to be closer to the action. So yes, you, you have your signage at the top of your building that you would probably see from the highway. Um, but the majority of your tenants actually want to be able to walk to lunch next door. So do you want to walk across the parking lot or do you want it to have more of that Boulevard City feel? These are flexible placeholders, mm -hmm. but we do believe that the majority of these tenants are going to want to be on that main street as long as they have the highway signage that's there. Yeah. I, I kind of lean that way. Plus, those buildings itself give a buffer to the highway, mm -hmm. and um, and then make everything look like like a, a, we originally talked about was the opposite of what's going on on the other side of the highway, where the parking lot's in the middle, everything else is on the outskirts. Mm -hmm. This everything's on the outskirts, and the parking lot is all around the out the outway. So I like that. Correct. And what you call them is A streets. So what we mean by that is a primary street as you're driving by. So if you're coming down Park Avenue or Beach Street, you want to make sure you can actually see that office building. So if that office building is pushed off the street, you're not fronting the building from the road. Also, if you look at the hotel or potential hotel, it's office or hotel in the southern portion, hotels are going to make sure their flag is visible from a main street. Mm -hmm. You may be able to see it from the highway, but if I can't look down the road and see it when I'm driving by, people are going to miss it. Cool. 
I like that the whole the whole central part of this is entertainment. It's you know park. It's there's just a lot of activity. Where's your Christmas tree going to go? Where I'm going to be? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got we've got two different spots we've looked at for it. Probably on the central green. Um, we have a big fire pit. You can kind of see it's a round circle right now. There's a big fire pit. Green. So that'll be up in that way. I would spiral light the smokestack. Yeah, right. Here's the smokestack. Look. Yeah. Yep. Um, when, when's construction going to start on phase one? So right now we need to finish up the TIF documents. So once we get the TIF agreement negotiated, it then goes to the schools. Then it'll probably take 30 to 45 days to finish that and then 30 days to market. We want it to be starting in early March. It's probably looking like mid-April right now um, based on whatever the issuance timing is. And it's being the realistic. First half of this year. Yeah, we, we were spending three to four hours a day in budget meetings. I mean, we're, we're on our third round of construction numbers since January 3rd right now. So we're... we're so we, we're exploring, can we do it inside the existing structure? You mean like an Could, elevator, you mean? An elevator yeah. inside, or do you move it outside? So right now it shows it inside, but there is potential it could move to this northern side here. Um, honestly, if it was up to me, I would do stairs in the mechanism only because the mechanism is the original historic mechanism of the clock. By putting in an elevator on the inside, you potentially could lose it. Um, but we are struggling with the whole, we want it to be ADA accessible, but in order to do that, how do we do that? How do we put an elevator on without ruining the historical exterior? Um, that is something that we are juggling every day right now, but right now this shows it on the inside. I will tell you to put it on the inside is about another million and a half dollars. Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it seems like the most re like logical thing, would, if, if it can work, is to put it on the outside because then you yep. have more space on the inside for people to actually stand up. I mean, it's not that much space already, so yep. put an elevator in the center of that be cramped um it's 400 square feet right now yeah and i still and then and yeah so and then i guess you all need to work with the fire department about you know evacuation type issues and yeah we have to have two sets of stairs on the inside as well so you have to have you know basically an emergency access from both points uh and that's kind of what's what we're, what we're working with so we could we know we could cut the concrete if we needed to on every floor but it, as you said how much observation deck do you really have at the end of the day um we've explored like how do they do um the stuff at the sea, I'm, I'm blanking on right now, but like, you know, lighthouses, things like that. Like, how do you do these historical structures in a historical context? I just don't have that answer for you at the moment. If it goes on the outside, it will be on the side towards the parking garage. Good. Okay. And that, make, that makes sense from a mm -hmm. visibility standpoint. Yeah. It just seems, I mean, I'm hoping that, to me, that's how it turns out. I feel like that's going to be the most logical way to do yes. it at the end, even though it does kind of, you know, hurt the view, but I think it provides the most access. Um, the clocks, the clock faces. So. I mean, you know, of course the thing that's in there, you know, it, it's not working today. Uh, is there any chance that whatever we do that we're able to get those clocks in a functioning position? Yes, that's the goal. We're working with Verdon Bell on that right now. Okay. So we have a couple of different options. If we kept the mechanism as it sits, what they would do is restore the existing historical, like the drum that spins. I'm not a clock person, so I apologize if I use the wrong terms. And they would put a new machine on top, basically, that would allow them all to turn. But if we put the elevator inside or we have to put the elevator, that goes away and then you would do something on the back of the clock faces. So our goal is to restore the clock faces, have them lit up and have them working. And are you seeing the fire department saying you have to have two different staircases to the top of that thing or just you're saying two inside the building overall? OBC requires two separate forms of egress and then ADA requires the elevator. So yeah, I mean, just seeing, I don't understand what the purpose of having two sets of stairs up there would be. Um, is, are there like ways that you all can appeal it if it doesn't make sense? We're working every option we can. Okay. Well, yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, Sets of stairs are about three to four hundred thousand dollars a set. Sure. So I mean, it just it all adds up. So how do we get this thing to be functional to get people up there as economically as possible? Understanding that there's not a ton of proceeds to cover it. So so how do we get? What does Summit Park do? I'm sorry. What does Summit Park do? They've got one. This brand is new construction, so it's different. It's it, so what we're running into is if we left it as historic but it becomes an observation deck, it becomes a change of use. So under change of use, you must bring it to current code and follow and comply with ADA. Mm -hmm. So, which we understand. We're, just, we're working through what our options there at the moment, um, but I will tell you, I mean, we, we talked about probably half our 45 minutes today, like how are we going to address this? What are we gonna do on costs? And, and we're looking at all our options to make it, the clock restoration inside is very economical compared to the rest of the project. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a lot to restore. I mean, it's a lot, but don't get me wrong. But in the grand scheme of what the development is, it's 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 minuscule. Yeah. Yeah. And Summit Park has one staircase. Uh, it's a pretty wide staircase, but one staircase yeah. that's open all the time. I'd imagine this would not be that the staircase that you. The all width put is in. the issue. 
yeah, imagine your staircase uh, would just be for emergency exit only, and that mm -hmm. the elevator would be the primary use. Um, so, uh, if, if, do you mind if we go to a different topic? Sure. Okay, yeah, so uh, the brewery, uh, do you all have something signed with somebody to fill that space? You don't have to announce the name, but do you have somebody that's going to fill it? Um, we got the final cost about a week ago. We're working on the rent numbers to get them a letter of intent to execute. So you all feel pretty confident that you have a, a but that's we have three people that have been asking us for the space, um, all of which you would know, all are very reputable and well backed. I, I, but we have a we have one group in particular we would like to use. And then what happens? Okay, so the clock tower building. It looks like there's another building that's built out directly to the east of it. Um, I guess maybe retail. Is there a retail space there or some kind? Correct. Of That'll be future retail. It's a pad. Okay, so it, it, that likely won't be built in phase one. That w that is in phase one. It will not be built until there's a tenant. Okay. Um, good. And then uh, the pool that's for the mm -hmm. apartment residential. So how does that separate with like the parts that are more public that other people can use? So there's a fence around it. Um, you actually have an amenity space inside this building and it's fenced in. Okay. And there's actually, a, it's, it's, it's a high fence. It's like a six foot privacy fence. You don't want people necessarily seeing or out. It'll be well landscaped, but yeah, it's, it's part of the central area. Sounds good. Okay. All the amenities we built had to be accessed by all the residents no matter where they were on the site. So we tried to centralize them. My only question is, where, uh, um, how'd you come up with Factory 52? Oh, months. Um, you know, we did, when we did the original survey, we had quite a few hundred names submitted. That one was submitted a lot. Our team liked it a lot, too. So a couple things. Um, Cincinnati, or the whole region as a whole, doesn't have any factory districts. So it was one thing that we, thought we could thought we could tie into is Norwood is where most people left the city of Cincinnati in the late 1800s to actually bring their factories. So that's why the factories were here. So we're like, hey, if we're going to create a district and create a look, let's call it the factory look, let's call it a factory district. So, but I also didn't like the term district because I feel like everybody's using the word district right now. So what we liked is 52 cards in a deck and just kind of pay homage to what the site was. Oh. So. Um, this, the other thing I just want to say, so I don't know, does all of council, I mean, I know I got the PUD stuff, I think, but does, does all, do you have the, the final PUD plan? So, I mean, if you could get us, I mean, even a PDF document of, of whatever you submitted to the Planning Commission, I think it's going to be helpful for us to have that mm -hmm. to, you know, we have the public hearing on Tuesday. I think it's going to be very vital for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to chime in there. We're still <laughs> trying to figure out what um, council wants us to present next week, how detailed. So we are looking for your all's feedback on kind of how in the weeds to get there. If you have thoughts on what to bring to council for that presentation, whether we re-give the planning presentation or we just focus it on this, or if there's questions you have that we think your colleagues would want to know before, um, this is also sort of a little bit of a trial run for us too, for council next week. So um, we are open to any and all feedback about meeting between now and then, or if there's other questions or uh, what you would like to see in that presentation that we can bring to council next week. But we can also make sure you get the whole packet too. So yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, definitely make sure the council members have the whole thing. And then, I mean, I'll defer, I mean, I'll let Gabby kind of work with you all if you want on what he feels, but I don't think it has to be, it does not have to be the whole planning commission presentation. If people want to see that, definitely they can watch that, but. Um, well, council, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, council, whole council did see like two meetings ago, the full plan. So I feel like this packet is kind of, I think one of the pages was called updates since yeah. prelim. So I think, you know, this was a really nice kind of what changed. Yeah. So we can do that in final materials too, because that was the other one that wasn't honed in. So you guys know that exactly what we've committed to as a company. Well said. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I was trying to think of the things I didn't cover last time I was there. That's correct. Um, yeah. so, so the original thing that we had, though, we had, it was the preliminary, like yeah. as I said, you know, it's the preliminary preliminary approval. So for sure, getting just like I said, all the documents for the final, uh, I think that'd be helpful. And then, but like like you just said, we've already we've gotten the bulk of the presentation, so. Uh, it sounds like highlighting that is probably going to be the best thing because at that at that meeting we're not considering TIF agreement we're just considering site plan we're considering design and and that's it so you know some of the stuff that we get to finance committee don't worry mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry about any of that because you all can figure out how you finance it you know in separate conversations we're just trying to figure out how we plan it uh, so yeah that sounds good um, the other thing that I have here okay so. What about the retail space that's uh, directly north of, you know, the Park Avenue extension, whatever you all name that street, but the little square retail space that's right at the corner of Kenilworth and Park? 
Is that a, is that like also a few? Is that going to be in like your phase one, or do you have a tenant for that yet? There's no retail down here. This is going to retail. Here. No, oh, it says retail. It says retail. This re is residential. Oh, it says retail. It's probably it's hard to read. It's residential. Oh, hold on. All right, it says retail four. I'm talking about north of Park. Retail four thousand square feet. Yeah, that's the one I said we're building at a feature point. So this this pad will be here. This will be grass. Okay, so this that okay, so that and then the one. So you're saying that one and the clock tower retail space. The clock tower retail will be built in phase one because that's our leasing center. So, um, and we actually have a prospective office tenant. Okay, I think we had, yeah, I think we were misconnected. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Anything else? Sure. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate Thank you, guys. it. guys. Appreciate it. All right. No one has anything else? We'll uh, go ahead and conclude this um, economic development committee meeting. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Great.